Here is the planet's ultimate game. The final of the 21st Football World Cup. Flicked in by Griezmann and flicked on! And France take the lead in the World Cup final! Welcome again to the Arab News World Cup podcast. We are down to the last four teams after some dramatic and in one case sensational quarterfinal matches. With me as always is Arab News Sports Editor Ali Khaled. And also we were lucky enough earlier in the week to catch up with one of England's greatest defenders and a veteran of the only other World Cup to have been played in Asia way back in 2002 in South Korea and Japan. The one and only Rio Ferdinand was with us. Ali, uh, the football low just keeps getting better and better and this last round delivered again. Uh, there's only one place to start, really, isn't there? The brilliant, outstanding Morocco. Hi, Pete. Great to be back. And absolutely, I mean, um, what can we say about Morocco? Um, we really thought uh, playing Portugal might be the end of the line. You know, Portugal had been fantastic against Switzerland, you know, 1-6-1. Um, and... You know, in the last show, you and I were discussing it. You had more faith than me. I was, I was saying, you know, my heart says Morocco, but my head says Portugal, and I was wrong. Um, incredible performance. I mean, obviously, for long periods they had to sit back and, uh, and and take the pressure, you know, but they didn't give up too many chances. And when they when they countered, when they found their moments, they attacked with such purpose. Like you know, they they've got such good touch, the midfielders. The attackers, you know, they, they you know, uh, they transitioned with such speed. It was very, very impressive. This was not uh, just a performance where they sat, you know, and hoped for the best and uh, and defended. They had a game plan. They had an absolute game plan, absolutely. Uh, and uh, and you know, it, it was clear in the way they, 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 you know, when they counter, you know, just how much you know training has gone into that. You know, they've they've done that throughout the tournament. And they just look great. Sufyan Amrabat in in middle has been amazing. Uh, I think the defenders on his uh, the, way you know, to the, the Premier League. On his way to the Premier League, already linked with Liverpool as well. You know, so um, you know they uh, they had the, you know they, they they had setbacks as well. You know, Saiz, their uh, their captain got injured. You know, was removed. But the goalkeeper Yassine Bono was in sensational form again. Uh, that uh, save. From uh, uh, Felix at near the end was incredible. He had another save from Ronaldo. It wasn't as difficult, and um, and of course that uh, that missed header from Pepe right at the end, uh, you know, could have changed things. You know, would have uh, really uh, it would have been a problem for Morocco, who by that point had had a player sent off. I think had it gone into extra time, they would have struggled, obviously, because uh, um, you, you know, down to ten men and. Portugal would have had the momentum. It might have been um, a different story, but so they really needed to sort of, you know, defend with their lives those last four or five minutes, and they did that. It was fantastic to watch, and the scenes at the end. You know, we've been talking about all the Arab fan fans, you know, the local fans in Qatar, but all around the world, you know, like they, they've just everyone's united behind Morocco, and it's fantastic to see all the all the scenes of celebrations around the Arab world. As we said at the top of the pod, we were lucky enough to catch up with Rio Ferdinand this week. But also, I caught up with Rob Earnshaw, Wales legend, and Kevin Campbell. And I have to say, I don't normally do this to you, but um, I was I was put on the spot, as I always put you on the spot for a Morocco prediction. Both those both those ex players, legends as well, by the way, both took Portugal, and I took Morocco to win one nil. Um, so one for me on, on this occasion. Absolutely. Listen. Ali, the underlying theme um, of, of this World Cup has been progress, definitely. Um, you know, but trying to put into context, and there's no one better to do so than yourself. Where does this sit in terms of achievement, the Morocco result for teams from Africa and the Middle East? I think, I mean, there's two things here, Pete. You know, first of all, in terms of a one-off result, I think, you know, I, I, well, I think in, in whatever category you 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 will look at. Um, you know, this will. This is quite, you know, possibly the greatest uh, sporting achievement. Never mind just football achievement. Uh, in terms of one-off results, I mean, you know, previously, uh, 
you know, you could say the previous best result was the win against Spain, you know, in the last round over yeah. penalties. But historically, you know, they, they beat Portugal again uh, in in 1986 uh, uh, in the group stage, in a group that had England, Poland and Portugal, and they won 3-1. Now, that team that did that in 1986, you know, is, is like the golden generation of uh, Moroccan football. And, you know, everywhere you go in Morocco, people remember them. They've got, like, pictures of that team, you know, that, who, who was the first... Uh, African nations first Arab nation to ever reach the second round they lost to Germany to West Germany in that uh, 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 back in 1986 to a very late goal to Lothar Mateus we mentioned this uh, in the last pod uh, so that had been like you know, Morocco's greatest result you know historically and you know not only they go and beat Spain at that round you know they go and beat Portugal again to reach the semi-final so in terms of a one-off match you know this is absolutely Morocco's finest result and in terms of like you know if we're putting it in context of Moroccan football or Arab football again, I mean uh, you know statistically no one has ever reached that stage, uh, and to do it at a time you know like you know the first World Cup held in the Middle East in the Arab world, you know when sort of the whole Arab world and many beyond as well, are, you know have are like mobilizing behind them really like uh, urging them on is fantastic and uh, you know it's. I mean, I hope it's it's a sign of things to come in future tournaments, future World Cups. But uh, you know, this you know this will be a hard trick to repeat for anybody. Never mind, you know, any you know uh, uh, Arab team. And if it goes on further, I mean, it's already the greatest uh, um, achievement in Arab football ever. And you know, let's hope it you know continues in the next long, round. Long may it continue. The the, the the winds of change are definitely flowing through football. Um, it's been a, a fantastic World Cup because of that underdog theme. Uh, underlying that theme, Ali, and I can't get away from it, I'll mention it in every podcast I do that has to do with the World Cup and probably for the next World Cups coming as well. Uh, Saudi v Argentina was definitely the highlight of the Cup of Underdogs for me. Uh, as I said, we caught up with Rio Ferdinand this week and uh, we put it to him and asked him the same thing. Yeah, well, I think that's proof. I think you've seen that and I think it's... it's... It's great for football that it gives underdogs an opportunity and a belief um, outside of football even. Even young children, young children that play the game believe that actually we can we can win if you work hard, if you're together as a team and you have all the good values. Um, and it's, it's proving its case in, 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 on the world stage. That's Rio's take. Ali, uh, are you in agreement with the big man? Yes, yes. I mean, uh, you know, we're... Uh, um... We've been going on about uh, uh, this match, uh, Peter. Uh, you and I, uh, the, the Saudi Argentina match, and and I think you know I've just to it again. Like, yeah, I mean, just to stick to that game a little bit, like you know, because uh, obviously Saudi are out now. But just to give it its importance, it was the first shock, big shock of this tournament. Probably still the biggest shock. I mean, I know like Morocco's uh, uh, results against Portugal is massive in terms of importance, but I feel like the, the Saudi game. You know, um, again, speaking of like the best and the rest and all that, you know, it, it was the best. Uh, it, it was the first of the of this tournament shocks and sort of set the template for a lot of those uh, other upsets that came later. Until that point, you know, we'd seen uh, Iran, you know, lose six two to England in the opening match. Uh, Qatar were very, very like, quite you know, very disappointing, you know, like they did not go for the match uh, in the match against Ecuador. They did not go for it. So Saudi, I think that that Saudi win really set the tone for the tournament, you know, and 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 from that point on, you just noticed all of the, so, the so-called underdogs really going for their, uh, for, uh, for their matches. Do you think it lifted them to see that anyone could do that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you think, uh, you know, uh, you know, Saudi, hardly anyone gave them a, a chance against Argentina. We didn't. We were looking at the second match against Poland thinking, yeah, they might get something there. You know, none of us gave uh, Saudi much hope uh, uh, against Argentina. And when people saw that, I think when other teams saw that, they thought, well, why not? You know, and and uh, uh, and, and you could see it certainly from the teams from Asia, you know, like uh, Japan, South Korea, you know, they they went on to perform. The the African teams as well. Tunisia just missed out, but they beat. I mean, they they, they drew with Denmark. They they beat France. You know, the, the world champions only missed out because of the of the loss to Australia. Another you know team that comes from the Asian Federation. You know, I think everyone stepped up after that match. Okay, it was the quarterfinals, and, and let's discuss that because speaking of upsets, 
Uh, again, it's the common theme running throughout this tournament. Fantastic, by the way. Um, the other shock of the quarterfinals was Croatia's penalty shootout win over Brazil. Uh, a lot of people are disappointed, saying it was undeserved. Are you one of them? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, Pete. I mean, you know, there's there's a stat that came out about Croatia. Like, throughout the tournament, they've only been in the lead for 46 minutes throughout the tournament, <laughs> including the group stage. So, clearly, they're not scoring too many goals. Clearly, they're not, you know taking the lead or or were like uh, or going on the front foot so there was there was definitely an element of brazil slightly deserved it more they played the better football uh, they were in control more they had the more chances uh, but you know as we keep saying you know there's no right or wrong way to play football and and croatia had to do what's right for them you know i mean they they have no uh, you know obligation to entertain at this stage of the world cup and and honestly i think maybe they didn't even have the chance to you know um uh, Luka Modric continues to be an astonishing presence for them, you know, uh, you know and uh, in the previous match he was taken off and we thought that maybe he looked a little bit, uh, you know, uh, his fitness might have caught up with him, you know, the years, but then he played full match against Brazil. Um, it was, I mean, if I had to say, you know, it was it undeserved, I wouldn't say that. I would say maybe Brazil deserved a little bit more, especially had, you know, they, you know, they took the lead with five minutes left and, um, it was quite criminal, really, that they let that lead go. Um, but, you know, you have to give uh, Croatia the credit. They just don't know when they're beaten. I mean, this team, you know, reached the final four years ago and we didn't think they could repeat the trick. And, you know, they were just a match away from it now. And to beat Brazil, you know, regardless of circumstance, when, whenever that happens, that is always, always one of the uh, highlights and, you know, I guess by definition, one of the shocks of the tournament. I have to say that you know people people have sort of memories towards what happens in the second half of a game of football. I look at the first half, and for me, there was patches of that first half where Croatia were far better than Brazil. So, as you say, a game over ninety minutes. Um, special mention for me for Perisic. I think he's had an outstanding. World Cup, absolutely brilliant. But what it does do when you see the likes of Croatia playing that way and Brazil, it just identifies really, you know, the phenomenal levels of football and what a great World Cup we've had. Um, speaking about being blown away, the other thing that Rio Ferdinand said was, and he was in agreement with us as well, about not just as a great World Cup tournament, but he was in agreement about the quality on the pitch. It's been really good. I was talking uh, to my... Um... Vibra 5 guys uh, my YouTube channel this morning and just we finished a conversation talking about how the football has been just like it's been the best World Cup that I can remember for a long time because the games the different types of uh, outcomes underdogs are winning you, you for instance you think about Saudi Arabia beating Argentina Tunisia beating France um, you look at these games Japan I forgot who they beat they beat someone Morocco beating Spain, Morocco beating Portugal. Like it's just these results are crazy, and these are teams that no one expected to be able to do this. So, for, for, and and you know one of the biggest things that I ask, I was asking on the way in the tournament is I wanted the uh, the the best players to play well because it normally never happens like that, but they are. Okay, Ali, another quarter final witness in one of the great games. You can probably put it in your history because I know that you love your World Cup history and all of the great games. This one's got to go down as one as well. Um, Argentina's penalty shootout win over the Netherlands probably could do a whole show on that match, but have you recovered from it? Um, an incredible match, Pete. You know, there's so much in there. Uh, as you say, we could do a whole show on that. Um, where to start, really? I mean, it, 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 incredible. It, it looked like Argentina... Um, had settled the match when Messi scored the penalty. Uh, you know, they, I mean, uh, first of all, we have to mention his his assist in in um, in the first half. You know, it was just sensational. You know, it, the, the ball. You know, you you watch it and watch it again, and you think, you know, how did he find that pass uh, to Molina, who who finished uh, for the opening goal? Uh, it, for me, a little bit reminiscent of uh, Maradona's goal. Uh, sorry, Maradona's assist to Kinesia. In 1990, um, and if, if you go back and watch that one, you YouTube, go to YouTube and check it out. You know, there's elements of that where you know Maradona got the ball, you know, beat two or three players, and spotted Kinesia when uh, 
free on the left and he passed the ball to him and Kenesha just finished. And and there's an element of that uh, in Messi's assist to Molina. It was incredible. And um, really, I know like on social media, like everyone went, you know, uh, nuts, you know, like, uh, and it deserved it. It was the pass of the tournament by a long way, I think. And, um, and then he, you know, you know, he puts away the penalty in the second half and you think it's over. You know, I mean, it looked like the match was done and, Strangely, Argentina, you know, they didn't kill the game off against Australia. They allowed Australia back in in the previous round and almost went into extra time. In this case, it was even worse. I, you know, very surprising. You know, you 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 think historically, again, you know, like a strong defensively. You know, they they know how to kill a game, and and again, they they you know, with seven minutes left, seven minutes of the ninety left, they allowed uh, Vigos to to equalize. And if you notice with that goal, you know, Argentina were playing so deep so deep, you know, like practically right in front of Emmy Martinez. And it allowed, you know, the six foot plus, uh, you know, strikers, just that free header, really, you know. Uh, you know, Argentina should be right up, you know, defending that free kick or, or even like trying to catch trying to catch them offside. But they were they just kept going deeper and deeper and deeper. And, uh, and of course, that incredible free kick by Holland took it uh, into extra time. You know, again, at that point, you know, just to add to the, to, you know, the, the, um, the unpredictability of this World Cup. At that point, we thought, right, you know, the momentum will shift to the Netherlands, but it didn't. You know, Argentina came back. Uh, Scaloni did a great job, I think, tactically. Argentina came back with a better team in in extra time. Could have won it, and then, of course, it went to penalties and all the nonsense and the fighting and all that. But uh, you know, I think overall, Argentina deserved it. But we I mean, what a what a game! You know, we could talk about it, you know, for another hour or so. No one likes to see that in the game, but it is a part of the. Let's be really honest about it. It does. It does add to a bit of the, the stardust of it all, doesn't it? You know, it the, does. It it does. I mean, like you know, you know, on the the next day we're seeing all these clips of you know, uh, and listen. I mean, like both teams had it. You know, you know, had their moments of gamesmanship, so we say, you know, but like in the penalty shootout, the Dutch players were trying to put the Argentinian players off, the goalkeepers were doing it as they always do, you know, uh, you know, for the first time we saw Messi, you know, a snarling, angry Messi, you know, we've never seen that before, you know, like uh, there's a, the clip of him on, uh, I think, Argentinian TV and he's shouting at someone, telling him to go away and it's, and it's, uh, it's apparently, you know, uh, allegedly it's uh, Vigost of uh, the, the Dutch striker and, yeah, and, and like we've never seen Messi like that. And you could see their celebrations, you know, they're absolutely delighted at the end, but like a lot of anger as well, like a lot of relief, you know, they're uh, venting. Um, yeah, just so much. And, and uh, you know, I know sometimes, you know, people will say, you know, we don't want to see that, you know, but in truth we do, you know, we'd like to see a little we bit do. of needle. That's what it's all about. You look, it's within, within reason. What it does prove, what it does prove for me is that you know, put yourself in Leo Messi's shoes. He's so close. He's so tantalizingly close to the thing that's avoided him. And he knows it's this is last chance saloon. Of course, he's going to feel like that. And of course, he's going to celebrate the way he did. Uh, again, I just can't wait for, for, the, for the next round. Um, listen, I wanted to pull you up on something because, you know, you always call things way before they happen. Now, even we were chatting and we've chatted on many shows as well as our podcast and sister podcast. When the World Cup was first announced, and when we chatted and when we were in the planning of this show, you said to me, you highlighted the fact that you were delighted because the infrastructure of the World Cup, it would benefit fans. And you even said to me, being in Qatar, you could possibly get two games in a day. And we laughed and we joked and we said, it's a football fan's dream. Well, that dream is a realisation. And again, the pundits have been on about it all this week. Have a listen to this, Ali. Amazing. I mean, we came out of the stadium with BBC the other day and the way they that they had the, the crowds funneling around to get outside the stadium was like, we stood there in amazement going, wow, the organisation has been crazy. Listen, I'm lucky. I get to get whisked in and out with security and stuff, so I probably don't see it as, um, as raw as a fan, but my whole process of getting in and out of the stadium has been crazy. And you know what? There's no traffic. I can't understand what's going on. I think the Metro is obviously working very well, but there's no traffic on the way in or out of the games. It's mad. Come here and be on the ground and see it and witness it before you talk. I think that's a key learning from, for, for me coming to this World Cup. I've seen and heard a lot of stories and a lot of um, press and media talking about 
what it's going to be like, what is that? And then you ask the question, have you been? Have you, are you there? No. Oh, okay. I think if you come, you experience it. I think my experience, I can only talk about my experience and the people that have been around me and what are here. And we, we've had a really good time here. Something else our sport editor of Arab News, Ali Khaled, called. Great stuff, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, as you said, before the tournament, one of the, you know, Pete, there's so much noise around this World Cup and all that. And we, you know, we've tried to focus on the football, what it's going to be like for all the all the fans there. And we we had discussed, one of the things we'd said, you know, the, the stadiums, you know, which I visited uh, earlier, you know, um, yep. uh, have looked incredible on television. You know, they are, are incredible stadiums, you know. So I think, you know, it's been, it's been a, as a fan experience, it's been great. Fans who have been there, who we, we've spoken to, we've spoken to reporters, we've spoken to fans, we've spoken to some of our friends, Pete, who've, who, you know, who have gone, and they've all said the same thing. It's been, it's been a fantastic fan experience outside the stadiums, inside as well. And, um, and I do know of a few people who have caught two, three games, you know, they're not supposed to, you know, <laughs> I think, you know, there's limits yeah. to what you're supposed to go. But, uh, you know, people have done it and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, planned, you know, uh, their you know, schedules to catch a couple of games in the same day and all that. And, and it's worked out. And, of course, this has never happened before, you know, in, in a World Cup. Uh, it, it's not, you know, I mean, you, you know, and, and fair enough, you know, if you're in Brazil, you know, you're, you're hardly going to catch two games uh, in one day or if you're in Russia. So it's it's unique to this tournament that this this was uh, happening and and something new as well i mean and and why not you know i mean people spoke about like the size of qatar probably the you know the not as many hotels mm. it's a, it's a much smaller uh, world cup of course it's like practically in one city you know so why not take advantage of that if you're there you know and and you know and, and, and enjoy as many games as possible we know it you know it i mean but you could tell from the surprise in rio's voice just there that yeah. you they, it, they've absolutely loved it as well. Something else, because they're used to going to tournaments in big, huge city and having to travel. It was evident that that was one of the things that Rio um, championed about his love of this World Cup. OK, last of the quarterfinals is our little review here. Um, England, France, uh, you mentioned it might have that Premier League feel like a derby game. And in the end, it was settled by two contrasting moments from a current Spurs player and a former Arsenal player. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it was slightly unfortunate for England, who played very well, I think. Uh, uh, maybe overall, in over the 19 minutes, maybe they edged it a little bit. But in that sense, I, again, you know, just to go back about you know, which team deserved it or which team didn't deserve it. I, I think in these situations, you can't, you know, we, we don't say a team deserved it more just purely on the, um, you know, on, on possession or even or even the number of chances. You know, it's about, you know, taking those chances, you know, and, and about, like, making those important moment counts. You know, like, uh, Giroud, Olive, uh, Olivier Giroud, who, you know, has beaten Thierry Henry's, all time France goal scoring record, which is incredible. He he won. He he beat it in this tournament. You know, had a, had a chance to win it for uh, uh, for France, and it was a great save by Pickford. But then you know he came back, and you know with the with that with the eventual winner, the header. You know, and you know again a big game player. You know, like when 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 they really needed to. You know, France stepped up, and England again. You know. Played really well, you know. I thought throughout, you know, and 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 there was that early penalty call, which was I, th I thought was on uh, slightly outside the penalty area. But it, but you know, the referee didn't even call uh, a free kick, which was strange. But they did get two penalties. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, this was not some massive injustice. I think overall in the match, a lot of people saying the referee was poor. Yes, he made a lot of mistakes, but I don't think there was like some massive injustice for England. And you know, you, you know, you can spin it any way you want. You know they had that penalty chance to to square the game and take into an extra time, and who knows what would have happened there uh, then, you know. Uh, and not for a second do I blame Harry Kane. You know, like these things happen. You know, penalties. Messi's missed a penalty. You know, we, we you know like we we talk about the, the Saudi penalty that Salim Adoshi missed against Poland. You know, maybe they would have gone on to to reach uh, you know the the second round. You know, there's been other you know Spain lost on penalties. You know, um, it's. You know, I think, you know, I wouldn't blame Harry Kane one bit, you know, um, for missing and certainly not for taking it. A lot of people saying someone else should have taken it. But 
you know, it was a great opportunity. And, and you know, while France, I think, stepped up when they needed to, England, you know, throughout played really well. But that was the big moment. That was the big moment. And, uh, and it just didn't happen for them. Interestingly enough, you say that, but what, what irks me as, a, as an England fan is the fact that it takes them to go behind before they start playing. They cannot get off to a, to a, to a fast start. Something, again, which for me comes back to the coach, the fact that he's happy to set up and make it difficult for the opponent rather than in a World Cup quarterfinal go for the jugular. I thought France had a lot more in their locker as well. Um, mm. And then my last takeaway from that was all of the talk was of Mbappe. There's only one danger man for me in front of the um, in front of the goal, and it's Giroud, and it was proven time and time again. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the guy is uh, is a fantastic player. You know, at 36, still stepping up, still getting the big moments. You know, and uh, don't forget the uh, you know uh, uh, Griezmann in the in the middle of the p- uh, pitch, probably the best player on the pitch, uh, uh, Antoine Griezmann that day. And I think this is again. As you say, you know, France looked like they could step up if they needed to. You know, I'm not suggesting they were uh, playing within themselves and all that, but you know, they, 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 you know, they, they, they always seem to have a measure of control, even when they're like the, the opposition has the ball, or even when when France when England are attacking. You know, they seem to have a measure of control. They know, you know, their you know their system very well, and and you you sense that if they need to step up and go for it, uh, you know, they can. And, you know, it had England equalized, you know, it was, you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes left of the match, you know, including uh, uh, stoppage time. Would France have gone for it? Who knows? You know, in the end, they didn't need to, like I said, because of the missed penalty. Uh, but I thought, uh, you know, uh, Antoine Griezmann was was great. Oliver Giroud up front, always a danger, you know. Mbappe, you can keep him a little bit quiet and all that. But he was involved in the first goal. But again, you know, what an outlet, you know, if you need to. Like, you, you, you can give him the ball and you know, that the opposition team will be on the back foot. You know, they, they can double, they can put two players on him, three players on him, and, you know, he will take the, you know, the whole, you know, sort of flow of the match will go, will veer towards him, you know. So uh, they've got the big game players, Pete, you know, and, and and they proved it. They did. Shame on England, though, for not exposing that France defence, not one of the greatest French back fours I've ever seen, Ali. And um, who knows in another, but a great game, a great game. And as you say, worthy winners and they'll be tough to beat. Listen, at this point in the early episodes of this podcast, we'd normally do an update on Saudi and other Arab teams. And last week, if you remember, I asked you if Saudi might be a little deflated after the euphoria of Argentina. But all in all, and I'm going to go with you first, because we asked Rio Ferdinand the same thing. But Ali, tell us, in the cold light of day, the, the future's bright for Saudi Arabia and its football entity, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, beyond, uh, you know, now it's been more than a week since, uh, you know, they were officially knocked out. Uh, yeah, I think so as well. You know, there's always that disappointment, regardless, you know, especially, you know, following the Argentina game, expectations went from like, you know, zero to 100. You know, you know it's just you know skyrocketed uh, but they were still playing like two very difficult teams in in uh, in Poland and Mexico especially Mexico in the last match who had to score as many goals as possible they were never going to ease off so so you know in that last match Saudi looked a little bit tired maybe a little bit exhausted they had a lot of injuries uh, they gave it you know 100% as usual uh, so there was a little bit of dif- disappointment i saw a few people on social media saying ah the coach let us down there, or you know, had we scored the penalty in the second game, or, or the players didn't do this and all that, and and I think you know they're doing them a disservice. I think Saudi played really, really well, and I think as you say, in the cold light of day, looking back on it, you know, with a bit of distance, I think it was a it was a good campaign. You know, like they were they were in it till you know the last match, which is not the case in previous World Cups. So uh, um, yeah, I think I think the future is bright. For Saudi Arabia, and again, just as they, you know, set the tone for, you know, a lot of the other teams, uh, you know, the underdogs in this tournament, I think maybe they might set the tone for other, you know, nations in this region as well, whether it's the Gulf or the wider Middle East or or Asia, and showing, you know, what you can do, you know, if you really go, uh, well, first of all, like, you know, having proper organization and promoting age group teams and all that, you know, that's the, the bigger picture, but also in specific matches, what you can do against the big teams. So many plot lines in the semi-finals. Give us your thoughts. How do you see them going? Right. So, uh, 
Uh, predictions again. So, Pete, you know, if you remember <laughs> last week, you you got you got Morocco right, you know, yep. and um, and uh, I said uh, I said like my head says Portugal and my heart says uh, Morocco. So I'm going to stick with that. You know, I'm uh, you know you know it, it's a policy that worked. So I, I still think France. I, I think France would probably be a bit too much for for Morocco. You know, while deep down I'm hoping uh, maybe I'll jinx them and Morocco will win. Uh, so uh, I'll say France to. Morocco won. Uh, in the other one, you know, it, by the way, if, if you remember, I, I thought Argentina would beat Holland 2-1. Mm. And that was that was the case until the 100th and 11th minute before they ruined my prediction. Um, I think Argentina uh, will win against Croatia. It'll be tough because, you know, we say this Croatian team just does not know how to lose, you know, almost. You know, they're incredible. And, um, and if it goes into extra time, they seem to be the masters of that. But... Um, I'm going to stick with Messi. You know, uh, I've said all along, I'd love to see Messi win uh, uh, win the World Cup. And I'm going to stick with that. And I'll just say one, one final word, you know, Pete, uh, you know, you, you just mentioned it. Yeah, there's so many plot lines, you know, there's so many narratives going on. You know, if, if France win it, if France end up winning the World Cup, they, they win the quarter, quarter, uh, semi-final and, and go on to another, it'll be it'll be their second win in a row, uh, which hasn't happened since 1962. You know, it's like... 62, you know, yeah. Since Brazil won it um, twice, you know, and um, you know, obviously, if uh, um, if Argentina win it, we've got the whole Messi uh, narrative, you know, like crowning an incredible career. You know, this will be it. This will end all debates about uh, uh, you know who's the greatest footballer of all time. For me, the debate is not there. He is the greatest footballer of all time. Sure. But you know, that would be you know, it, it's just what a way it would be. Like, I mean, World Cup finals are historic by their nature anyway but this would be an incredible one if croatia win it they that would probably be the most unlikely win in world cup history if you think about it you know they will it will be one of the most unlikely win, probably the unlike unlikely win in the world cup history but if morocco win it it'll probably be the greatest sporting achievement of all time world cup or no world cup it will just be uh, an unbelievable achievement uh which we've like we've never seen before OK, well, to continue with my trend of the World Cup of the Underdog and for our Arab News podcast, I'm going for a Morocco-Croatia final. That's my prediction. Um, look forward to catching up with you on the next one, Ali, and we'll see how that came about. This has been the Arab News World Cup podcast. We'll see you on the next one. <laughs>